Hello, I'm Stian Solanweis from the University of Manchester. I also work for the BioXL uh, Center of Excellence in the EU. I'm going to talk to you today about our crate and by compute object and how we can use that to describe and package workflows. Uh, first, I want to give you the annual reminder of the FAIR guiding principles. You may have heard them before, but if not, here's a quick intro. Uh, so this is a very influential paper published in 2016, which has since uh, influenced a lot on uh, funding and open science movement and basically trying to change how we do something as simple as publishing data for our research. As you probably know, people are not always very good at this, but this paper sets out some good principles to follow. The the letters FAIR are actually an acronym something for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But behind it, we have some actual principles that you can try to follow. So uh, scientists are meant to make sure the data is findable by uh, having metadata and data assigned global identifiers, which you don't throw away, keep them working. Um, having rich metadata to describe the data. And in those metadata, use those identifiers right don't just throw them away and you register this data and the metadata in some searchable resource or repository to make it accessible should be retrievable by the same identifier and using some standard communication protocol which should be open and this means the m sometimes the data is not like available maybe it is just too big or maybe it's actually not meant to be shared, it could be personal data and so on, that's okay, but the metadata must remain accessible even if the data is gone. Interoperability is key, so making sure the data and importantly the metadata is uh, following some structured uh, formal knowledge representation, some kind of syntax that the computer can understand, uh, wherein you should use vocabularies, so you agree about what the different keys uh, mean in your columns and so on and in there you should have some reference to other metadata where they exist it's quite hard to follow all of these principles but they are kind of guiding so we should kind of move towards them and this is to improve re reusability of your data and for that we also need to know the license so you're allowed to do it and some attributes to describe it like how large is the data say anyway this was proposed for data, but now there's a strong movement to say this should be used also for software in research and also for computational workflows that are using that software. So you see here the idea of fair computational workflows, which we published just a year ago now in the Data Intelligence Journal, has now spun up several different workshops and independent projects starting up. And you see my boss down there in the corner, Carol Goble. Uh, who presented uh, a special theme on com fair computational workflows uh, in both ECCB and the Workflows RI community. And so he's showing that there is uh, an appetite for making sure workflows themselves are also shared using similar principles. So if we look at this, which is a paper for someone doing metagenomics, and uh, I'm actually quite impressed of reading this because here the authors have done exceptionally well in uh, for imp rep improving reproducibility and explaining their methods. You see, I've, I've highlighted in bold all the different tools they've used, which they've included their versions and options and everything. This is unusual. You don't normally see that, right? This is very high level of detail. Yet, if I want to run the same workflow, I cannot click run on that paper, right? It, I will have to spend weeks, if not months, trying to build a similar workflows installing the tools, connecting them up, and so on. And if you look at uh, this particular paper, they've also shared the individual scripts and so on that they've used, but when you say workflow, it's actually just a shell script, right? That's the most common thing, right? That there is a shell script underneath. So if we think about that, how can that be described and shared using the FAIR principles? We would need some kind of overlay on top to provide a metadata, because clearly a few comments in there that just says analyze doesn't quite cut it. So this is the idea that uh, made us uh, come up with the concept of research objects uh, that started uh, about 10 years ago now uh, 
in the, the seminal paper linked in the bottom there now led to lots of uh, new work which i'll tell you about and uh, the idea of research object is that you gather together not just the data not just the csv file not just the the log files not just the scripts that made those csv files but you you bundle all of these things together and you relate them to each other using rich metadata so the metadata is key here as well it's because each of them will come from a different place they will have different authors for instance and one thing leads to another and if you use a structured language for that that means computers can understand it in s as well as uh, machines as computers and machines computers and <laughs> humans which we know are not machines right yeah uh, our crate is uh, the latest evolution of how to express such research problem because we talked about metadata the way you need to write it down using a formal uh, knowledge representation so this is one of those um, and it's actually built upon existing standards on linked data something called scheme.org which i'll come back to but really it's a lightweight approach even though we're trying to use existing standards we try to kind of hide most of those details as i say it's a community effort so anyone can join there's a large list of uh, collaborators there and so we're trying to just put together the best practices on how to write down formal metadata and make it fair but also uh, not just for describing simple data sets of a couple of files but also large computational analysis but what's in the heart of it so uh, i'm gonna have to scare you a bit with something called json uh, you may have heard about it so this is the web developer's favorite knowledge representation if you want to call it that uh, basically it's just a key value pairs and you can do arrays of those and so on uh, one problem when you're using these JSON, if you've ever tried using web APIs, is that everybody makes their own, right? So they all have different words they use. And so you're breaking that other fair principles about vocabularies, right? Because it's not interoperable if everybody makes up their own words. You just squash the text into something that looks like a structure, but where everyone is special. And that would make it very hard for something to do like find all the workflows which do our genome sequencing analysis right because if they all express it differently you can't do that kind of program uh, so in our crate uh, we are kind of locking down some of those aspects using something called schema.org which is uh, a large initiative which is actually used for marking up web pages originally so it's led by google and it's what gives you that little search info box when you find uh, a business or something but it's a very large vocabulary of words like the red things you see on the left there which we can reuse also for data sets and for all kind of useful things because it seems like we need many of the same things peer persons and organizations is an example shown here right so in our crate we separate between those two things because we have the data entities that are things we are describing files and down and downloadable things in a sense database and so on and then contextual entities things around it things that have helped make it or uh, otherwise and in our crate we basically tell you how to do those uh, as what looks like specification but this really is a uh, more like a guidance best practice guidance because we're showing how to use the existing standards but in a very uh, simplified way which uh, is easy to get started with you can go on and do more if you want to but you don't have to you can just start with a simple thing so we're kind of doing linked data but you don't need to know so we're kind of hiding some of those details but an important aspect of that is also to have tooling so you have um, software libraries to help you get along and uh, for most people are not developers so they need something more clickety click and therefore we have uh, especially the sydney partners in this project they have developed something very cool called describo which is a desktop application for doing that simple use case of just putting together a couple of files describing them hence the name and also linking in authors publishers and so on but you can click the blue buttons and add in additional things as well so you can go kind of off-piste if you want to and and that's a kind of 
easy go going way to get started with making an R crate and you're making formal metadata at the same time, which you can then use with the other tools, uh, which I'll show you a bit about later. So here's a similar one, which I've just started just like a month ago called Describer Online. So this is a kind of web attempt to do the same thing. Uh, it's a, actually a bit more general because it, it now handles all kind of types, but not just the prescribed one that we have listed in the Arrow Crate pages. Now here you can use the OneDrive uh, as the starting point here because in the uh, University of Technology Sydney they have they just said the the data repository this is just a OneDrive. We're paying for that to Microsoft anyway. Just put all your data there. Of course, there's no metadata in there. People have very weird file names and so on. So if you just overlay an Arrow Crate in there, you can describe your data and connect them up together. And it's not taken off by a further EU project to connect to other cloud providers. Now, here's a very interesting project which uses our crate, but you don't really see it. So uh, there's something called Paradisic, which is uh, digitizing cultural records. So we're now into digital humanities. There's no molecules in sight. And, <laughs> and in here, we, we find that you're finding all these recordings of people speaking their native languages and so on, and you have transcriptions of those, digitize those, you get lots of different files with different attributions and different types and so on. And to formalize that metadata, you have to have quite a bit of structure because you want to keep them separate but merged together in a way. And, and that's what they've done here. But actually, uh, beneath the hood, it is our crate, yeah? but you don't see it, right? Unless you click the secret button in the corner. So you see that kind of metadata shown here is actually extracted out uh, from an Arrow Crate. Now it didn't start as Arrow Crate, but they converted it into Arrow Crate uh, so that they have actually preserved their metadata. Because they said an important aspect for them was not just to make a lovely portal, but for all that rich metadata to also be preserved, even if they stop using that portal, right? So you want to make the metadata fair as well. So this is a project that I've been working on in Manchester and several other EU partners, uh, something called Workflow Hub, which we're quite excited about. It's, it's fairly new, so it's just starting to fill up now. It, it's a repository of computational workflows in life sciences, where you can uh, register your workflow, no matter which language it's implemented in. Uh, we also catalog existing repositories. and. One challenge we had there was to support the many different workflow languages, and they often don't have much support for metadata. Even simple things like, you know, who's the author of the workflow? It's not gonna say in there, right? So we need some way to capture that metadata and keep it. And also some workflows are not just a simple file, they're a set of different files working together, just like in programming languages. And again, they can have different attributions different provenance and file types and so on. Because if they're good, they're actually reusing each other's work, but then of course they should be, you should be seeing again, your name and the things that have been reused. So it's many of the same challenges we saw before with the cultural heritage example. So if you just look into that, has her in workflow hub, how a workflow has been uploaded and then <coughs> you get the diagram for it, you can see, and then metadata shown on the side. So for the user, you can see all these things, you, you can fill them in and so on. And also the inside of the workflow, maybe description of the steps and so on. Um, but actually, if you click the button to download our crate or use the equivalent API to do so, you will find the structure metadata is also available where hopefully all of this information is also captured. Um, I will admit not all of it is in there at the moment, but most of it should be. Uh, but now we're also looking at doing that also for registering workflows, right? So not just to show the work, share the workflow metadata out again, but also to reuse such structure metadata from the outside. So you can maintain it separately on the outside in GitHub. So this is something we're doing in the Pyxel project because we have some real-world workflows doing COVID-19 analysis on supercomputers. And this is not so complex not so easy as the previous example because here you have multiple files with different options and so on so uh, here is actually a whole github repository just for one workflow and that's a very common approach that we see now that people maintain workflows as if they're source code so that's a very promising uh, 
development and i'm very happy for that because that's not how it was 10 years ago uh, but we see here that the arrow create is useful because you can describe all the other files in your repositories because if you have more than three workflows which where do you start right so you need to know that kind of thing and that's why we have an advanced upload where we can do that and then keep it in sync so you don't need to go and update anymore still work in progress because people will try to break this in different ways now to make these kind of platforms you need good software libraries so i'm not going to say they're good you see we have version 0.2 but they are maturing a lot and uh, we have for several programming languages and that is helping a lot this kind of development and that's another aspect is that fair is not just for machines we talked a lot about the machines being happy but <laughs> or the developers being happy but most people are not right uh, they are they just want to read text so if you have all this metadata uh, structured uh, there's a lovely tool uh, that can uh, call our create html again from our sydney partners who will render it for you as a kind of table based thing but here you can click into individual things so it's you can go and explore one by one of the resources described for instance here on, on the right you see we clicked into the chipsec example and we can see the individual orders of that particular file but also links to how it's related to other resources it looks interactive but it's actually a single html page that just reads that json file and therefore this can also be stored and preserved you know not for eternity but for as long as we have web browsers uh, and so you will have this living along without any infrastructure running now let's move on to buy computer updates because that's really why we are here today you might have remember several talks about the biocomputer objects before i have been standardized right so i i triple have uh well working with i triple we have made a standard called 2791 2020 uh the year we all want to remember right and <laughs> you can go and you can go and download the standards if you pay or have access but you don't really need to because most of the definitions are actually shared open source in the JSON schemas. So this is what the programmers want because here you can see all these keys that we talked about, but for for biocomputer objects, they're, they're already formally defined in there. Now, so the old name biocomputer objects, that's now, uh, we can think of it like Wi-Fi versus 802.11 so there's a formal standard and a, and a word for it that is more like a colloquial name but it's also the user community so we have regular meetings and so on and there will be lots of documentations and tools and libraries and so on those kind of things for biocomputer object now here you see some json for biocomputer object it's not meant to look like because uh, <laughs> It's a bit too much to look at as a human, right? So the hu the computer is meant to look at it. Uh, I'm going to insert a nice picture with colors in here, so you can see that, uh, which separates the different domains. So the key concept of a biocomputer base that you have provenance domain, usability domain, description domain, execution domain, is to describe different aspects of a workflow, essentially. Right, so you say, where did it come from? How do you run it? What does it need? What is it actually for? And that's very important to know what is it really useful for so you don't run it you know on the wrong species or something and what i'm going to look at today is how to combine these two standards right because they look like they're doing the similar thing right this is about describing things but not quite the same way right so what we're talking about is how to put by computer objects into our create so making some kind of package of the bco now why would we want to do that uh well the bco itself is it's just that JSON file, right? It's, it's just uh, a description of the workflow, but I mentioned there are also all the other, other files which uh, we may want to talk about. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So let's pick a use case. So here's one that uh, we use, which is just gone a bit of pissed, go through a bit of things unfamiliar to, to me, uh, which is the next flow workflow system, which I'm um, has nothing to do with me and therefore I'm, I'm a bit more neutral to it but it's a very nice workflow system which is very popular for running particularly on the cloud uh, things like next gen sequencing uh, pipelines so here's something interesting called uh, nf core which is a collection of kind of standardized workflows that are very well maintained by a community of developers so let's just imagine someone wants to submit one of those just 
straight into FDA, right? Uh, it's probably the wrong by biomedically it's probably wrong to to use this particular workflow, but I like this particular workflow because it's really nicely documented, right? So you see all the different steps are well documented on the web page. You can see the outputs, what what are they meant to mean, and in the individual parameters you can set. And in many ways, if 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 all workflows were described like this, you probably didn't need the biocomputer object, right? So part of the reason for doing by computer object is to force that kind of information out of people, right? So there's a blank slot that needs to be filled in. Um, because you can imagine generating this kind of output from those fields in the by computer object and uh, and that therefore the users would have to fill it in so they don't get empty sections. So I want to use this as an example for making a by computer object, which I'm then gonna wrap in the RO crate. And I like this workflow because I can just pick up all the information from here. I don't have to use my own workflow, which I know too well, and which I will just fill in things off blank. Here we, we already have the information. And it's nice to testing because you can just run it on the command line if you have Nextflow installed. There's no additional s steps for getting it ready. So it's good for getting started with as a tutorial. So this is what we built as a tutorial for how would you do this yourself given that workflow. So once you've learned to do it with that workflow, you can hopefully do it yourself with your own workflow. So this we have published on the by computer website. And the way we start is basically step zero is <laughs> install a workflow menu. Because we're using Nextflow, most people maybe are not using Nextflow, so uh, we will have to show you how to get started with that. It's just two command lines to run actually, but it, it depends a bit on on your machine how to do this particular step. Uh, usually most people know how to run their own workflow engine, so when you want to do this with your own workflow, you don't need to do this bit. But a good question is, how do we capture this information in biocompute or our crate level? Because there's no slots for this at the moment for how to get the engine for running the workflow ready and running in the correct version and so on. So in the tutorial, what we're starting with is, is just some kind of skeleton things so showing how to make these JSON files. So kind of like giving you an empty template to start with and uh, how you fill in all the different things. And as we're working along, we're filling up this data directory. And uh, we'll come back to this later why we call it data. It's not all data, but that's the name we're using. And so we can think of the BCR as describing a workflow as a true and exemplar run. So this is why we're gonna run the workflow because in be a computer object you talk also, just like in you saw in the Nextflow website, about inputs and outputs. And the easiest way to talk about outputs is to have some actual outputs to show to. And that means you need some example inputs to run it with. And luckily we saw that workflow had that. Uh, but before you even start, you, we can talk about the workflow definition, the script that you're kind of running. Right, and that goes into the provenance domain of biocomputer object. So you see in this tutorial, we do have to cover some aspects of the BCO as well. So there's also kind of a bit of a tutorial for how to do this with a biocomputer object, um, because we'll come into some questions on here on what, who do we mean? What, who made what? For instance, I'm using this workflow from NF Core, which I didn't write. So I should acknowledge the original authors, as you see I've done here. But where do my name go? Now, I am not an author, but I help uh, create this BCO. I didn't put the knowledge into it, but I helped putting it together. So already you can see how these slots, uh, by being flat in the biocomputer object, can get a bit squeezed. And this is why I want to the BCO to be focused on the workflow, because that's really what the BCO is describing, and not all these other things we have around it, like the data files and so on. So it's worth to point out that uh, BCO do allow you to specify different roles of contributions, like you can distinguish between someone who authored, someone who helped make the knowledge, versus someone who created, maybe just made the files or saved it at a particular format, uh, or even someone who has been curating, reviewing something, or importing it, moving it from one place to another, or just retrieving. And uh, these different types of roles you can specify at the BCO level. 
uh, and, and that's quite, quite powerful for this particular use case where we have different people, different organizations who are contributing in different ways. Yet uh, a BCO still deals with the workflow and the BCO a sub single submission and if you wanted to break it down further like saying how uh, who made a particular data file uh, then you need to go into our create level so that's where the our create kind of complements the bco in that instead of focusing on the different roles you can specify on the different things that have been contributed and attached people and organization at that level so you see that this both different approaches may be represented the same uh, contributors but in in different ways and a different perspective into their contribution ships and similarly for our crate we make a skeleton the skeleton for our crate is quite small but still a couple of lines and that is because the first thing in our crate always does is to describe itself so following the fair principles it should also uh, self-identify so we know what it is and basically it says I am an our crate right so there are, we have different versions and so we say which one we're trying to be it may not be true, but at least you know what, what it's attempting to comply with. Uh, so in the tutorial, we look a bit about uh, how you fill in these different bits of the R-Crate and the BCO in tandem, bit by bit. Some things, sometimes there are overlaps, but actually there are differences. For instance, we come back to order. Uh, the data set, this R-Crate, the collection, the order of that is whoever put it together so that's where my name can come in so you see I put my identifier in as an author here and again we can have a different license for the package rather than an individual file in there sometimes we have a mix of things and that's okay because in our grid we can put we can override these under individual nodes for each of the files and say actually there's a different license here there's a different order for that and so you can provide additional metadata for each thing where you need to so the tutorial then goes on to how to run the workflow and uh, this is where we thought it was easy because it's just a one-liner from Nextflow, they were very helpful. Uh, so all the test data just comes in and, and it just runs and it will take a couple of minutes to run but, but uh, while it's running you can fill in the biocomputer object. But then you get some questions like well, what about all this test data and I should be declaring that in my bco should i not right and therefore where do they get from luckily there's a log you see in the corner there we get some urls coming out which you can click on and that's how nextflow fetches the data and so those fit perfectly into the bco and luckily they also fit perfectly into the r crate because in both cases we're using urls as identifiers and that's basically making linked data it's just identifiers you can click on so sometimes you have to decide on your own identifiers because you're making new data in your run. Uh, the easiest is just to refer to them locally in your folder paths. Um, sometimes that doesn't work because they're too big or you're not allowed to share them, that kind of thing. When I did this, uh, one of the big data is 100 megabyte, one zip drive, right? Because uh, GitHub doesn't allow more than that. So then we had to do external references for those kind of files that raises new questions so we address a bit about that in the tutorial as well so what about the results uh, when you get them coming out uh, you may want to do this description of them uh, in our crate is not a manifest you might think of it like it is but it's not you don't have to declare every little file you have uh, but you can declare folders right so in this case we just list the individual folders which corresponds fairly well to that documentation pages we saw on the NF Core website, which means we can fill in that kind of description for each of those and talk about a group of files together. Or maybe we should just link directly to the existing documentation. You can do both. But when you do these things, you need to refer to things on the outside, things that are not captured, things that are not files, uh, or at least not files within your package. Those are contextual entities things in the world you can think of it like and they could be living things like people or organizations or it could be software particularly here we want to say what kind of that we use this particular next version to run it and uh, the workflow itself is a piece of software 
and the next one example here is interesting because the Merkle definition itself is also download, down, downloaded on demand which means we need to capture which version was it downloading and in both in BCO and in our crate have slots for that but in our crate you allow to add additional things because you have a whole object for that software so you can fill in uh, who was it published by for instance or what date was it from so you can fill in as much as you want or as little as you as you desire you can explore further so in a sense you can think of our tutorial as a kind of meta guide because we're just saying what you could look up for in the other documentation and maybe it's sufficient to just build it on the examples we have but you can go further in when when you're special right when there's something extra you want to do like publishers or funding equipment and so on finally the tutorial is showing how do we package data up how do we actually put things together because when you draw this lovely box how, what does that actually mean is it a zip file it doesn't have to be i think often we don't want a zip file and uh, maybe we just have a collection of files but that raises a big problem of how do you know even all the files are there did i copy them over correctly did I mess them up in my editor? What happened, right? So when these things are moving around systems, especially when they're not in, say, a Git repository or something like that, you need some way to make sure they are complete and not changed. And again, we'll be using existing standards. We're using Bagit, which is a way of just capturing checksums of files. And here you go, a manifest. So the manifest file for a particular checksum will just have checksum, some hex numbers and the file name so you can see that all the files are there and that they haven't changed and there are existing tools that can make and check these things for you so then you know all the files are complete so you can think of this as a kind of distribution layer and in fact there is also a mechanism in Bagit to have they call holy bags so there's holes in the bag where you don't include all the files so you can exclude certain files maybe because they're big or requires authentication and that's something you can read about in a big data bag paper linked in the bottom there. And we have not explored this yet with, uh, with the BCOs, but if, of course it should work with them as well. The question then is how do you archive certain data out before you publish your shrunk uh, bag in the end. Uh, but the tutorial will show you how to get started with it is, uh, as an easy way without necessarily using all these tools. Now, when you have this uh, arrow crate, uh, as I said, we also want to keep the human in the loop. So we're showing you how to make this uh, uh, human readable uh, version of the arrow crate metadata. And this is the same as I showed before. Uh, but once you follow the tutorial, you will also be able to make that. So we're talking about separation of concern because we have all these different standards we are putting together just three of them really uh, but at first it seems that that is complicating the picture uh, why can't we just do it all in one go well one reason is so we can reuse existing tools as i said uh, each of them have a good collection of tools uh, the other is that it's already been figured out why not just use uh, the existing way of doing it so for instance Bagit is capturing only the checksums of the files uh, which is really good at. Uh, we don't want to reinvent that. You could, in theory, to put metadata in there, but it's just a key value pair, so they're kind of very loose, so it's not really suitable for much uh, structured data like we're trying to do here. The arrow crate uh, level is kind of describing an individual uh, data files and the other things in the world, as I said, relating them and typing them. So it's putting connections between things. Uh, it's not explaining the inside of things. That's the role of the biocomputer update, at least for workflows. So you can say, what is the workflow for? What does it consist of? And then, of course, you have the data itself, which we also include, and the workflow itself, which could be by reference. It could be as a file inside. It could be as a URL, so which it is in this case. Uh, and of course, you can do this for any, any kind of workflow system. We just use Nextflow because of the documentation we had there. Uh, personally, I've, I've worked more with uh, CDRL, Galaxy, and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, you're going to find all kinds of workflows coming in through your biocomputer objects. 
and so we think of this layering here as doing different aspects of putting things together so what is the next steps now in the bco our crate well we want to get more feedback right because now we just kind of come up with this thing and put it together we want to test this to make sure it makes sense and uh, and try to also do this with a not so ideal workflow one that is not so well documented where the bco and the arrow crate will be the ha do the heavy lifting of carrying all that description and maybe then you can generate the human readable views from that and this is this tension between how much can you collect these annotations manually from people and how much can you generate automatically for instance a good workflow system will know what are the list of steps in it but how do you get that extracted out and get it into the bco do you have to do individual parsers for each workflow system like we've done in workflow hub or is there a better way uh, we're also looking at interactive approaches like now we this tutorial is very based for it's kind of targeting developers right so we are kind of a bit in the command line a bit in the js and that kind of thing and as i said the op the other people are not so familiar with that and that's not really a good way to throw people into making this it's a good way to scare them off actually so we have all these desktop tools that we talked about the by computer objects also have bco editors which you can use interactively for making bcos so now that those tools have matured at the same time it would be good to do a graphical version of this kind of tutorial and uh, also about how to consume them which i think is more important for the regulators because you want you will just be receiving these hour crate with the bcos inside them and then thinking what do i do now you know don't necessarily want to make a new one you want to consume the one you have so you could focus more about how to browse them maybe if there was no human readable uh, equivalent how to render that using these tools like calcite also looking at project integrations i talked about workflow hub and uh, it doesn't have any bco support at the moment but if there was we could pick up all those lovely things we want to render right and of course me being at one foot in both ends i can help with that uh, we also work closely with the common workflow language and again common workflow language one reason why i did not use that in this example is because it already has lots of good hooks for metadata it's the odd one out right so in a sense again that almost does not need bco almost does not need our crate but most workflows are not like that right and even if the hooks are there people don't fill it in right um similarly with galaxy and we know we already have work with making bcos from galaxy that is kind of standalone at the moment it's kind of web-based so the, the bco is kind of trapped on the web and which is nice as for linked data but it's a bit fluctual right? you cannot just fetch the whole thing so there's another role for our recruit in there to to package up all the results of your galaxy workflow with the bco on the side and the our create descriptions generated from within galaxy and then you would need to complete a few things to make it uh, uh, fulfill the purpose so that concludes my talk about bco our create and i would like to thank you all